Yeah, this WWE wrestling, I don't know. Yeah, if it was like legit fighting or like some sort of boxing or MMA, like, yeah, you get destroyed. Okay, so um, it's the last time we ended by talking about where firms maximize profits in the um, in the perfect competition. So firms maximize the profit at the point where the marginal revenue equals the marginal cost. So if looking at these, looking at our graph here, point where the marginal revenue is also the demand curve and the price, where it crosses the marginal cost curve. And now the profit they're going to make for each unit of good is going to be the difference between the price here and the average total cost at the profit maximizing point. So the difference between these two curves is going to be the profit per unit. Then you get their total profit, you're just going to multiply that per unit profit by the quantity, by the number of units that they produce. So that's, that's all I wanted to say about that slide. Um, so yeah, this points out that it's a common error for students to think that the, um, the profit maximizing quantity is where the marginal cost curve and the average total cost curve intersect. Um, so that would be here on the graph, but um, they would still be able to make, make um, a higher profit by producing until they reach for marginal revenue <coughs> marginal cost. So this would be below their profit maximizing quality of this case. So um, we know that we should produce at the level where out of output where the marginal cost equals the marginal revenue. And so far we've been calling this the profit maximizing level of output. Um, but now my question for you guys, and what we're going to explore next, is what happens if the firm doesn't make a profit at this level of output, or at any level of output? What happens if you know, their costs are too high for the price that they're going to receive for the good? In this case, the firm is just going to try to minimize their losses. They're going to try to make, like, I don't know, lose as little money as possible in the short run. Um, especially like if firms have high fixed costs, and uh, sometimes um, you know, making a loss is unavoidable. It's something they're going to have to put up with in the short run. So it turns out that marginal revenue equals marginal cost is still the rule you're going to want to use, even if they're not going to be making a profit. So this will be what we call the loss minimizing level of output, but it's basically the same idea. This right here, um, this shows where a firm, of uh, the best case scenario, when a firm cannot make a profit. Um, so here we see that the average total cost curve right here intersects with the marginal cost curve and the marginal revenue curve, where they intersect each other. So they all intersect at the same point. So the difference between the price and the average total cost is going to be zero. So obviously in this case, profit is going to be zero. Zero times whatever quantity, you know, still zero. Um, so the best this firm can do, like if they're <coughs> performing at their best, is to break even. But this firm should still follow the marginal revenue equals marginal cost curve because if they don't, if they don't follow that, they produce fewer, or like less quantity or greater quantity. They're going to lose money instead of just breaking even. So, like I said, the marginal cost equals mar marginal revenue rule still leads us to the optimal level of production. The same is going to be the case here with the firm that's even even worse situation, a firm that cannot make a profit. Um, for this firm, the price is always going to be lower than the average total cost. Um, yeah, because profit is the, is the difference between the price, or between this curve and the average total cost curve. Because the average total cost curve never dips below that, they're never going to be able to make a profit. Um, so this firm, they're going to be forced to operate at a loss. And again, you calculate the loss the same way you calculate the profit. It's the difference between the price and the average total cost, which in this case is going to be negative, and you multiply that by the quantity, the number of units that they sell. Um, but by selling at the, at the quantity where marginal revenue is marginal cost, what they're going to do is they're going to minimize their losses in this case. Um, if they go produce at any other quantity, they produce either down on this side or over here, 
they're going to have a greater loss. They're going to lose even more money than if they produce square marginal revenues with marginal cost. So they're still going to want to follow that rule even though they're losing money. So whether or not a firm can make a profit is determined by what their average total cost is in a perfectly competitive market. Um, so if their profit or their price, excuse me, is greater than the average total cost, then they're going to be making a profit. If the price is equal to average total cost, then the firm is going to break even. And then if price is less than the average total cost, the firm is going to earn a loss. Um, so no matter what industry, what product, what level of output we're talking about, whether they're producing like four goods or like 40 million goods, these rules are going to hold. Um, this relationship always holds for perfect competition. So do um, you guys have any idea why a firm would want to continue to operate in the short run if they're operating at a loss? If they're not able to earn any profits? Why they wouldn't just like shut down? This seems counterintuitive, right? If you want to make money. In this case, you're not able to make money. But think about the future. Maybe they think in the future that they, you know, they're not making a profit now, but they're going to be able to lower their costs in the future, or maybe the price is going to increase in the future. And in that case, they're going to want to keep producing until they have those workers ready to go. Um, it also might be too expensive to close. They're already paying for the factory. They're paying for all these things ahead of time, all their fixed costs. If they're already paying that money, they might as well keep producing. So a firm that is um, in a perfectly competitive market that's operating at a loss, they've got two choices to do. They can either continue to produce, keep making these goods at a loss, or they can just shut down completely. Um, each firm in, the per in perfect competition must accept the price so they can't, you know, they can't increase the price to try to make more money. They can't do that to stop their losses. Um, all they can do is choose their quantity in the short run. So a firm stops production, like I said, they still face these fixed costs. Um, so a firm that's, the, their fixed cost is going to be the maximum loss that they're willing to, to sustain. If they, if they produce goods, they're gonna have variable costs and they're also gonna have revenue add to that. So if the variable costs are greater than the revenue, then they're not going to produce in the short run, obviously, because they're going to be losing even more money by producing. Um, so by not producing, they minimize their losses, and I don't know, that's the best that they can do in the situation. However, if, they're, um, if their revenue is greater than the variable cost, in that case, um, they're going to produce because their losses are going to be you know, slightly less than if they just shut down production completely. Um, in your accounting 102 class, they talk about this a little bit, when to produce at a loss. That was probably the only thing I found interesting in my accounting classes, figuring that out. So for those of you who haven't got there yet, that's something, maybe the only thing to look forward to. That or like a bunch of loads jokes. <coughs> so when we analyze a firm in the short run, we need to uh, consider its fixed costs as sunk costs. So sunk costs, they've already been paid and they can't be recovered. So think. Easiest example is, is, um, is like the factory, the, the restaurant, you know, whatever, wherever your location is, you have to pay for that building or pay rent. You've either got a loan for it or you sign a contract to, um, you know, for your lease. So you got to keep paying on that. So no matter what you do, that cost is going to exist. It's going to be there. Um, so the best example I have for, um, that you consider from your own life for some cost is, um, Consider a relationship. Say you've been in one for two years with somebody, your significant other. Um, things aren't going well for you two, but but the thought in the back of your mind, oh, you know, it's been two years. I got a lot of time invested in this. Like we've been through so much together. Um, but you can't recover that time. That's a sunk cost. You've got to think about the current state and you got to think about the future. Um, so, um, so our farmer from last class um, that we talked about in the example, he took out a loan to pay for, um, for his land. That's a sunk cost. He's required, like he signed a contract, he's going to pay that back every month. So whether he grows crops and sells them on the market or not, he faces that cost. 
that's something he can't um, can consider when he's deciding whether to produce or not because that cost is going to be there. So the firm's shutdown decision making is based um, only on its variable costs in the short run. Um, so they should only produce if their total revenue is. I think they made a mistake. Should be total revenue is greater than variable costs. Oh, never mind. It said produce nothing. Okay, then. Yeah, that really threw me for a loop. Okay, yeah, they should produce nothing if its total revenue is less than the variable cost. Obviously, because they'd be losing even more money in that situation. Um, so the, the equation they give you, you know, total revenue less than variable cost through the miracle of algebra, um, it's also equal to the price being less than the average variable cost. If the price is less than the average variable cost, the firm's gonna shut down. Um, they'd experience an even greater loss by producing goods. And that's, that's not something they're gonna do if they're rational and you know, trying to, to make money, to lose as little as possible. Um, so if the price is greater than or equal to the average variable cost, then the, um, they're, they're gonna keep following the marginal cost equals mar marginal revenue rule to figure out how many units to produce. And they'll produce at the quantity where marginal rev revenue excuse me, equals the marginal cost. And for a perfectly competitive firm, this means marginal cost equals price. It's that horizontal line. All right, so here is the firm's short run supply curve. Um, so now, because price equals marginal revenue for a firm in a perfectly competitive market, the firm's gonna produce where the price equals marginal cost. Um, so the firm is going to supply output according to its marginal cost curve. Marginal cost curve is going to be a supply curve for an individual firm. Um, obviously, it looks different from the normal supply curve we do for the market. That's just upward sloping. But in a perfectly competitive market, the supply curve is going to be the marginal cost curve. Now, well, where the price is too low, where that's below the average total cost, the firm's gonna produce nothing at all. So if the price is anywhere below this P min right here on the graph, they're not gonna produce anything. That's why right here on the zero. Um, this right here where marginal cost equals the average variable cost, that's the shutdown point. Um, at that point, it's no longer worth it for the firm to keep producing when the price is that low. So at that point, they'll produce a quantity where it intersects with the average variable cost curve, and then from there, the supply curve goes up to marginal cost curve. So now the market supply curve is determined by adding up all the individual firm supply curves. Perfect competition is just like any other market where this is the case. Um, so the firms, they take the prices given, um, whatever you know, the market price is, uh, that's what they're gonna sell at. And then they're gonna choose their level of output. Really, the only choice they're making in this market is their level of output, not like the characteristics of the good or the price of the good, just, just the number of units. So here on the left, the graph is, the, is one farmer selling like 15,000 yeah, 15, bushels. And they're assuming that this is representative, their supply curve of all of the, all the individual farmers. The one on the right, that's the market supply curve. It, you see it's the same shape. You're just adding up all those individual supply curves and then it's like, like 2.25 billion bushels. So you're ending up with the same, you know, same shape of the supply curve when you add up all the individuals into the market. The last section is titled, If Everyone Can Do It, You Can't Make Money At It. Um, so now we're gonna talk about perfectly competitive markets in the long, long run and what, what that's like. So in perfect competition, the economic profit equals zero in the long run. Now um, remember, we talked in the beginning about implicit and explicit costs. 
Um, this is where it comes into play here, because not all costs are monetary. Some of the costs that these firms are facing are opportunity costs. So they're not going to appear on the balance sheet, but it's other opportunities where the firm could make money. Um, so economic profit is the firm's revenue minus its implicit and its explicit costs. Minus both of those. Uh, while the firm may earn an accounting profit, the accounting profit just being um, the revenue minus the explicit costs, that's what you're going to see on a balance sheet. Um, so they could earn an actual profit. They could be making more money than they're actually spending. Um, a firm could make more money in another line of business. Maybe instead of instead of that farmer selling wheat, selling, I don't know, they could do corn maybe and make even more money. So even if they're making a profit selling wheat, by switching to corn they make more money, that's, that's an, an implicit cost that they're facing. That's an opportunity cost. Uh, and this is factored into economic profit. So um, let's use an example. Let's say Ray Gillette, he starts a small um, cage-free cage -free egg farm. I don't know really what Nicholas Cage has to do with eggs, but apparently, apparently he's starting a farm with not involving him at all. So he manages this himself, giving up the $30,000 salary he'd be earning at ISIS, uh, working as a secret agent. Then he invests $100,000 of his own money into the farm. Which, um, so he has to forego $10,000 per year in investment income that he would have received you know, by putting that money in uh, some sort of mutual fund. Hopefully not putting it into Bitcoin. Um, so both the salary that he's giving up and then the investment income are implicit costs of running the egg farm. These are costs that Ray would not have incurred if the farm didn't exist. Um, and money he would have been work making had he continued, you know, working at ISIS. Um, but this profit, this isn't going to last in the long run. Remember, entrepreneurs are attentive to profit opportunities. If they see that there's money to be made in cage-free egg farming, they're going to enter that industry and use that as a chance to make money. Uh, new people are going to open up farms um, for cage-free eggs, and other existing farms are going to switch from the caged eggs to the cage-free eggs. Um, so maybe uh, Pam Pooley, she switches from being a dairy farmer to, uh, to raising eggs, or to raising hens for their eggs. Um, firms can go from one line of business to a similar business if you know if there's more, more economic profit to be earned there. So if this happens, when the, or when, when other firms see this, when they realize there's profit to be made there, the number of firms in the market are going to increase. More are going to go in there. They're going to start selling these products. And they're going to increase the supply of eggs and lower or raise profit. Oh, that was that slide. OK, so, um, so here on the left is the market for the cage tree eggs. When, when Ray like first quits ISIS and start his firm. So this is your, your typical market, the upper open supply curve, the downward slope, and the bank curve. They intersect here at $3 per dozen. So for Ray, this is going to be the demand curve, marginal revenue curve here, right at $3. Oh, that's extra credit, all right. I just shut the door. <laughs> Extra credit and a broken leg. Um, Is it worth it? Is the trade-off worth it? No. Broken leg for one point of extra credit. And I almost fell off the chair. Let's take a look at this climb in the background. Nobody else wants to sit down on the chair over. So where uh, marginal revenue equals marginal cost, right here at $3. Um, that's the price is greater than the average total cost. So this right here is going to be the per unit of profit, and then multiply that by the quantity, in this case 50,000 dozens of eggs. So that's going, the area of this, 50,000 times that difference, is going to be his profit. Obviously, entrepreneurs are going to notice this. They're not going to just sit on the sidelines like Le'Veon Bell. They're going to try to take advantage of, of you know, this opportunity to make money. So they're going to jump into the market instead of losing money and going to the Jets. I mean, instead of continuing with the less profitable 
enterprise. So this is going to shift the market demand to the right. So it'll increase the quantity and decrease the price. As we talked about before, the supply curve moves from year to year. Go along the demand curves to where they intersect. Now it's only two dollars. This is going to decrease or like shift down the demand curve for Ray for his for his uh, farm down to two dollars <coughs> as well. At this point, marginal revenue or um, crosses marginal cost curve where they intersect. It also intersects average total cost. So at this point, units are only going to decrease for the profit now. The economic profit is zero. The difference between between the price and the average total cost. Zero. So, through the competition, the more firms entering the market, as they go down from this supply curve down to this supply curve, they're going to decrease the price he can earn to feed away his profits. At this point, there's no more incentive for firms to enter the market. There's no more profit to be captured, so they're not going to jump in. They're going to stay in their own line of business. Before, before I move on, um, like I said, at this point, the marginal revenue is going to equal the marginal cost, is going to equal the average total cost. Um, this is the long run equilibrium because no more firms are going to be entering the market. Um, at this point, in, perfect, in the perfectly competitive market, competition is done. There, uh, that's it's kind of a static situation. No more people are getting involved. No more people are leaving because they lose money doing the opposite. So unless something happens in the overall market to shift the demand curve and to change in consumer tastes and preferences, you're not going to see, see new firms jumping in, people leaving, anything really changing. This is the end of the game. Um, so uh, let's suppose that uh, consumers' tastes and preferences do change, that they no longer want to eat um, as many pastry eggs. Maybe the FDA changes their mind again, and now they say that eggs are unhealthy. All right, who's uh, how are ranked the Golden Girls? I right, who's your favorite Golden Girl? Let's go with that. Who's my favorite Golden Girl? Yeah. I don't even know. Can you give me a thumb? Aren't they old? Yeah. The show was on like the 80s, but Betty White's still on. Betty White. Betty White. She's great. White hair. She wasn't that. She was such a ditzy character. What are the, what are the four? Right. I said on the syllabus, so I catch you not paying attention. I can ask you anything or roast you. Okay, ask I you. totally forgot about that, so now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask random questions. What are the four? Do so I still get my extra credit points? What? Do I still get my extra credit points? Yeah, you can stand up and kind of walk. I didn't stand up. Falling falling down is like a way to walk in someone, right? Yeah. In some cultures. I mean, at least I acknowledge that he's leaving. Okay. So in this case, consumer space and preferences are changing. The main curve is decreasing. So now this is going to lower the price. There's going to be fewer eggs supplied and the market as a whole. Um, so in this case, the price is falling to buck seventy-five. Right here, we were at equilibrium. We're in the perfect situation. No firms are going to leaving. Nothing's going on, we've reached the end of it. Now it's down here. So the price, the marginal cost curve right here is way below the average total cost curve. So Ray, he's not going to be breaking even, he's not going to be making a profit at this point, he's making a loss. And 25 cents times 25,000 doesn't make. That's, that's a decent amount of money that he's losing. So what's Ray going to do? He's still going to produce for marginal revenue equal to marginal cost because that's where he's going to minimize the losses. Produces anywhere else on this curve, on here, the losses are going to be greater. So, Ray's suffering an economic loss, but so are his competitors. They're also facing the same sort of loss because the price is too low for them to compete. Um, so, some of the farmers, they're going to leave the Nick Cage free egg market for a different product where they can earn a profit. Maybe Camp is gonna go back to, um, to a dairy farm. 
So this is going to reduce the supply in the uh, in the market overall. Yeah, we have a slide here for it. Reduce the supply in the market overall, and the supply is going to keep decreasing. People are going to keep leaving this market until the supply curve moves back up to where um, trusted maker here at two dollars. Once they get back to two dollars, we're now in equilibrium again. Marginal cost of market revenue is an average total cost. So there's zero economic profit. So what have we learned from this example besides the fact that my jokes are lame? First, if firms are making economic profit, more firms are going to enter the market. They're going to jump in because they see that there's a chance for them to make some money, and they're not just going to pass up on that. Next, um, if firms are making economic loss, some of the existing firms are going to enter or are going to exit the market. They're going to go somewhere else where they can make more money. Again, this is obvious. Someone, if you're if you're a business, you're not trying to lose money. That's not going to be good for your shareholders. You're not going to last too long if you, you know, keep racking up losses. Um, as they leave the market, that's going to drive their prices back up to the break-even price for um, for the individuals, individual firms, individual farmers, you know, whatever in this market. Um, so basically, what's going to happen is the price is going to be driven down to the minimum point on the typical firm's long long run average cost curve. Long run equilibrium is one in which the entry and exit of firms has resulted in the typical firm breaking even. This is the end game. This is what you know what everything's working towards. So this means in the long run that the market's going to supply any demand by consumers at a price equal to minimum point on their average average cost curve. So the long run supply curve for the entire market is also going to be horizontal at this price. So in a perfectly competitive market, the long run price is completely determined by the forces of supply. The number of suppliers adjust to meet the demand at the lowest possible price. Um, so here's an example of the long run supply curve. When the demand increases here, it's going to increase the price. This is the initial supply curve, this is the initial demand curve. And it moves from here to here is going to increase the price up to three dollars. Individual firms are going to recognize there's a chance for economic profit. They're going to jump in. Um, when they jump in the market, they start producing these goods and selling them. Obviously, they can't choose the price, so they're just going three dollars. And if more get in, you know, two ninety five, two ninety, two seventy five. They're going to as the supply increases, it shifts to the right. They're going to move down until they cross that demand curve. Here at two dollars, this is the long run um, you know, breaking in price for all these for all the individual firms. So basically, you say long run supply is going to be is going to be right at two dollars. It's going to be horizontal, and we can use the same thing, same story, just with losses to explain that. So the problem with perfect competition is that it's an abstraction from reality. Um, so these models, they're uh, meant to deepen our understanding of what the real world is like, but um, it can't be useful if they don't simplify the real world. If you contain all the complexities that we have in the real world, then, then it's not a model at that point. You're just looking at the real world. And it's difficult to try to understand everything that's going on. So we break it down, make as many assumptions as possible, to try to um, have something that we can actually work with and to understand. Uh, however, this means that perfect competition isn't really a good, good model to describe what's going on in the real world. Um, and you think about it, firms try to different, differentiate their products all the time. Um, there's very few industries where firms try to sell, or where they all sell the same exact product, where there's no difference from one firm to the other. Um, firms try to compete on quality, you know, they, some firms try to make a really good product that will never break. Um, some firms try to have like a real piece of junk product that's super cheap. But hey, it's really cheap, so people are going to be willing to buy it. Um, they can tie their goods even if it's exactly the same to other goods. So think gasoline's all the same. 
Well, how do sheets can be? They have all the made to order food, they have all that stuff. They draw you in for all the, I don't know, all the extra stuff, all the, the food or what have you. They have clean bathrooms, cleaner than like most other gas stations. You know that their time, when you stop there like on a road trip, you're also getting your gas there. So they're able to compete on these other goods and you know, differentiate your gasoline from other firms, even though the gasoline itself is exactly the same. There's also brand name capital. Sheep, I mean, sheep is another example, especially in this area. Everyone knows sheep. They're going to stop there instead of going to Texaco or you know, just Turkey or whatever random gas station. Um, firms that have been around for a long time that advertise a decent amount, that, um, that are known for their quality, people are going to return to those over, over other firms. So by building brand name capital, they're able to differentiate themselves from other goods. And you don't have you know, perfect competition. And finally, the end state of perfect competition is, ironically, a lack of competition. That firms aren't trying to innovate, they're not trying to do anything new. Um, they're just kind of there, all producing the same goods. And we know that's, not only is that like not true in the real world, there's no progress in perfect competition. They're never you know, getting any better. You're not getting different goods, you're just getting the same old thing over and over again. Um, remember, com uh, competition is a constant process of entrepreneurial discovery, People trying new things, succeeding and failing. Um, consumers' tastes changing, and firms succeeding or failing to meet these new changes. It's a constant process that's, that's continuously going on. It's not something that happens for a little bit, then they reach equilibrium, then it stops forever. Um, which, perfect competition, looking at this model and trying to apply it as it is, that's something um, that's easy for people learning to suffer things. So it's something I, I want to point out to you guys. So although perfect competition is a useful model, and it's something you know that's important to learn, um, it, it can tell us a lot about the market. It isn't a great proxy for the real world. That there still are some differences that we need to keep in mind. Um, earlier, unfortunately, Des isn't here today, but he asked me earlier in the year like the difference between like the main line and the mainstream economics. Um, this is probably the biggest difference: is the reliance on the model of perfect competition. In your typical like mainstream class, they would just keep perfect competition, move on. I wanted to to focus at the end and tell you guys like, while this is important to know, this doesn't perfectly describe reality, and we need to remember that. Um, there's so much more that's important about the competitive process than about just I don't know, just producing or marginal revenue because marginal cost and um, taking difference between that and the average total cost. Um, there's more going on. And that's something we need to keep in mind. And at least in my opinion, that's like the good stuff to study in economics is like the competition, understanding that the entrepreneurial process, not just not just moving cost curves around. So now an example of a perfect competition and the economic profit being competed away. I know I just got done telling you this doesn't happen in the real world. Here's an actual example from the real world. Uh, when, so when firms earn economic profits, obviously other firms have the incentives to enter, enter that market. They have a chance to make profits. They're going to jump into it. So when the iPhone first came out, um, what, this is mid-2008, um, it was instantly profitable. And that was you know, like the first time apps became really popular. And so apparently 25,000 apps were available in the iTunes store within the first year. The cost of making an app is like is super small. If you know how to code, I don't know, you need like a computer and and time. That that's the like what you need. So if you've got the programming skills, you can jump in and write an app and you could post it in the store. And so a lot of people got in. Initially it's just a few people, they were able to make great profits either by charging a price for it. I don't know, I didn't have a smartphone back then, so I don't know if they had like advertisements baked in them now like or then like they do now. Now you'll get like a banner ad on the bottom of some of your like free apps, which I mean I'm fine with as long as I don't accidentally press on it. But firms jump, there was, there was a big profit for those early people doing it. Other people, other firms saw that, they jumped in with their own apps, competed away the profit, at least the economic profit, got it down much, much lower. Um, it's difficult to to describe apps as perfect competition because there is, I mean, as you guys know, there's differentiation between the apps. 
Um, who uses the Yellow Page app that comes on their phone? Yellow Page is like the, um, was the old phone books? It, it's an app on my phone and it updates like every like three days, even though I've never opened it, and it won't let me delete it off there. The yellow yellow page. I'm an Android, maybe that's why. Okay, well, lucky you guys. But I'm sure you guys use your Instagram app like six times a day. Use your Twitter app and your Facebook. There's other ones you use all the time. So there is, and they have different uses. So there's differentiation between these apps. But perfect competition is a great model for people that jumped in early, had an economic profit, and then more firms getting in and like competing that away. All right, so um, let's take a break there. Those were done with that chapter. Do you guys have any questions on perfect competition? Okay, so let's take a break here. Um, so I'm going to be gone next Thursday and the following Tuesday. So April. So a test is scheduled for next Thursday. Um, Tuesday. I'm gonna do a little bit of like a little bit of lecture and then we'll review for the last like forty minutes probably. Can you be here for the test? I cannot be here for the test. What if I so so if it's either next Thursday or the following Tuesday. I don't really care. One of those days you guys have to take the exam, one of those days you want a class. I'll leave it up to you if you guys want to have it Tuesday or Thursday. Wait, like so it's we Thursday or the following Tuesday. Thursday. So Thursday. Thursday. Uh, I'm going to have one of my GAs sitting here for the exam. Alright, wait, okay, so who's saying Thursday? Oh, wait, me, me. So that's the, the first opportunity. Yeah. 11, 12, and 15. 15? Yeah. Okay, so... So the month of April. So this is next week right here. Tuesday, I'm going to be here. We're going to have class. Thursday, I won't be here. The 4th. And then the, uh, where is that? The 9th. I won't be here for that day either. So you're looking at the 9th? Let's do hands. Who wants the 4th? Is that Thursday? Yeah, that's Thursday. That's the first one. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Sorry, 1. Wait, let's do that, do that again. I lost count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. All right, who wants it the following Tuesday? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. <laughs> it's tough. I'm, I really don't, I, I don't care. That's the thing. It makes no difference to me. And you're not going to get the exams back any sooner. You take it on the fourth, the stuff's fresher in your mind. You take it on the ninth, you have more time to study. <laughs> now that's too much. For Caesar, we do. We have two. For what? The center, the knee center. The knee center? It makes salad. Caesar salad. <laughs> I'm telling you, they make Caesar salad. It's like our mom's at Wait, I went to Frankie's last night. That's what oh happens when we get a mask. Okay, so we got it tied. I don't. <laughs> Who's got a coin on him? <clears throat> you have a coin? So, what do we do on Tuesday? Tuesday? Um, maybe 30 minutes of lecture, probably shorter, and then review for the rest of the class. Okay. Who's, wait, who's not going to be here Thursday? Is someone else not going to be here Thursday? I, I somehow want to have a coin. <laughs> you have a coin? All right. All right, we'll flip it. Yeah, okay. Oh, I'll flip it. Can I do it? So, so since it's your coin, you get to choose heads or tails? Tails. Tails, and you're Thursday? Tuesday. Yeah, following Tuesday. Tuesday. The second one, all right. Tails, Tuesday. It's heads. Oh, 
Yay, Thursday! Uh, I mean, like, perhaps. <laughs> but it's not going to be here, so what do I do? Just take it. Okay. <laughs> 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 Thank you. 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 Thank you.
That's not a monopoly. Monopoly is where there's, it's like, there's only the iPhone, you can't go anywhere else, so you've got to buy from Apple. <coughs> Um, yeah, so Tesla, they're not a monopoly because there's, there's other electric cars out there. You can get like a Nissan Leaf or a couple other ones. Even though Tesla is like substantially different from those, they're close enough that it's not a true monopoly. Would you consider like internet service? Because like we have, maybe it's like my town media company and all of our wireless underground car development. So they have a monopoly on like internet service. But then you could get it through Verizon, but it's through like telephone lines. So the difference is like two megabit per second versus like 150. Would you consider that like a big enough difference to say that <coughs> it's not like a close competition? Um, I don't know enough about the like internet. How big of a difference is two megabytes versus like 100 megabytes? Three megabytes per second is like the internet in 2000. Uh, oh shit. Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, like here. A lot of cases when monopolies exist, it's when it's like. They had like they're the only one in an area, mm -hmm. so like the only electrical provider in an area, only internet in the area. Because they can charge whatever they want, <coughs> like no one's going to buy them three megabits per second. Yeah. So. But the problem is, if there was another firm that came in to try to like sell internet that was like comparable, it would be so expensive to put it in that you wouldn't be able. It'd be a high cost anyway. And that's, that's more of the stuff we're going to talk about next class, about antitrust policy, about how to, how to deal with you know, firms, about there being no, no opportunity for cheap goods. OK, so we, the two reasons why we study monopolies is that um, some firm, hey, Max, uh, who's your favorite pro wrestler? One question. What's up? Who's my favorite wrestler? Yeah, pro wrestler. John Cena. John Cena. <laughs> All right. So some firms are truly monopolists that they're the only one. So we study this because, you know, let's see what they're doing, try to figure out how they make the profits, what they do. Um, another thing is that firms could collude in order to act like a monopolist. So you got four or five firms, but they're all like on, their board of directors are all on each other's. They're, um, they're basically acting like monopolists. They set the price together. So you, even though there's different firms to buy from, there's really no difference between buying from each of them. So question for you guys, do monopolies really exist? Let's take this example. Last year, or up until last year, Loretto had one pizzeria. You can go to MVP. So was MVP a monopoly? Did Walt have a monopoly on the pizza, pizza market in the town of Loretto? The, uh, the close building down there? Yeah. I thought that was no. apartments now. There's apartment there was always apartments upstairs. Uh, I don't know what's downstairs. I don't know if they sold the place downstairs yet. Like I think they're trying to sell it like somebody else I don't know. I just know they jacked up the rent last year like out of nowhere and yeah, had to leave like yeah, yeah. immediately. Well let's think about how MVP operated. They had competition from Frankie's, from LPG and from Torbian. These were all local establishments. Um, <laughs> I guess Spanky's too. Um, yeah, this, so this is different. It's not pizza, but it's different food. And you can get pizza at the LPG. You can get pizza at Frankie's and Torv. I'm assuming it's Spanky's too. Um, it also has competition from Smith Meyers that provide pizzas for you to cook at home. You can go there and get a frozen pizza. You can go to Walmart in Evansburg, get a frozen pizza. Um, obviously, these are different than like a true pizzeria pizza. So if you think these alternatives are close enough for MVP pizza, if they're, um, they're a close substitute, then MVP would not have been a monopoly. So if you think, you know, going, uh, get your wings to the LPG, going, like, eating your food for, um, you think that's close enough to MVP pizza, that's good enough to substitute, then they're not a monopoly. Or if you would, if you think cooking at home is the same, your own pizza at home, that's, like, close enough quality, then they're not a monopoly. But if you think they're too different, if you're like, no, I, I want that legit, like, freshly made pizza. I want Walt's Buffalo Chicken Pizza. I don't want crappy DiGiorno from Smith Myers. Then they are a monopoly. Um, however much you, however you consider whether it is a monopoly or not, they definitely do have, or they had some monopoly power. That where they could raise prices and obtain economic profit. Even if they weren't able to act like a true monopoly, 
they were they had some sort of market power like a monopoly. Uh, a question the book asks, which I don't want to get into because we could spend multiple classes talking about this, is is the NCAA a monopoly? Like all sports are monopolies. Um, so one of the Harvard economists borrowed claimed the NCAA is a monopoly, and he uses its monopoly power to decrease or eliminate what student athletes receive for athletic efforts. Um, obviously, they don't let them keep their name or likeness, not allowed to sell an autographed jersey, other BS like that. So where do monopolies come from? Um, so for a firm to exist as a monopoly, there has to be barriers to entry. It has to be something that's preventing other firms from joining into the market and competing against them. Now, the four main barriers to entry are uh, government restrictions on entry, the control of a key resource, network externalities, and a natural monopoly. So we're going to look at each one of these individually to um, understand them. And the first is government restriction on entry. So the U.S. blocks entry, uh, the U.S. government uh, blocks entry in two ways. The first is with patents and copyrights. Um, yeah, so these are for newly developed products or for, um, for new, I guess, advancements in the production process. Uh, this is, um, so what patents are is the exclusive right to a product for 20 years from the time of the application. Uh, it grants property rights to a firm or for, to an individual that prevents others from using the product, the design, the process, um, whatever it is that they patent. And this is done to encourage innovation. Uh, individuals able, or firms, are able to, um, to reap some of this profit. They have monopoly power in the short run that makes up for the time and the money that they spend trying to come up with this new, new idea. So for instance, the, the R&D for uh, pharmaceutical drugs and medical devices, if you're trying to create a new drug, uh, it's going to take you like a decade or so, or millions and millions of dollars in order to do so. Um, so patents encourage encourage this sort of innovation because, because of its time and its expense. So they get a monopoly for that product for 20 years. You know, the firm that comes up with whatever whatever new drug or new medical device. Um, this ensures that they have enough time to recoup the money that they spent on research and development. All the time they could have been making a profit by, you know, by selling something else. They're able to, to profit off of that drug. And it is kind of annoying because it increases prices for consumers. But at the same time, if, it, if there was no patents, no intellectual property, and firms, the second they like, came up with a new drug, someone else could jump in and do it, um, no one would do research and development. Every firm would try to free ride off each other and try to just like take the other one's uh, new drug, their new development, and then we end up with no new drugs being produced. Um, so in this case, it's like a public good um, that the, the patents are a way to, to prevent free riding and encourage, encourage these firms to, to go and produce or to research and develop these new products. Now, um, uh, to, yeah, copyrights. Copyrights are the exclusive right to uh, produce and sell. These are like works of art, literature, um, things like that. Um, and these last for 70 years. So, um, so if uh, you're looking for a book or for something that's over 70 years old, you can go online and get that book downloaded for free. You don't have to pay for it. Something to remember. Um, and it's all legal. Project Gutenberg is like a really good source to go to if you're, if you're especially like if a class is like you can buy a book instead of dropping twenty bucks on Amazon, go there and get it for free. Same with music, right? Uh, yeah, same with music. Um, I, now, now I forget, but there was some like big album that was just about to to lose its um, copyright. I remember people were talking about that a couple months ago. Now, but now I can't remember what it was for the life of me. Um, let's see. So there's debate among economists about intellectual property, whether it's more helpful or harmful. Uh, some say it's really good. It's, it's the system we have right now is great. Uh, some say we need more of it, that um, we need longer protection to help encourage more people to develop these new things. Uh, and some say we need shorter, that, it's, that this monopoly power is you know, hurting consumers, hurting the market, preventing it from operating efficiently. And, and there's some that say that we need more in some areas, that some 
some things, you know, like maybe drugs and medical devices. We need longer term patents for that. So to like encourage more innovation so firms can profit from that. And we need less in other areas. So we're not harming consumers for advancements that don't really make them that much better off. I don't really have enough knowledge in this area to debate whether, whether it's good or bad, how much more we need and how much for what type of product. But I just wanted to point out that the debate is out there about it. Uh, the second way the government restricts entry is the use of public franchises. Uh, so the government, what they do is they designate a firm to be the sole provider of a good or service in an area. Um, so an example is local government with an electricity supplier. They'll contract with, say, Penelac, and everyone has to get their electricity through them. Because, like the example for your town and the internet, it'd be too expensive to have another company going out there and, and running their own lines. Um, be too disruptive, like, I don't know, wires everywhere crisscrossing the streets. Um, it end up... You would, it would end up wasting more money than it would um, benefiting consumers. So to do that, they just give one a monopoly and let them, I don't know, they regulate them to make sure they don't charge too high prices and then just let them go wild. Um, and another example under public franchises is the uh, public enterprise. These are things like the post office where the government um, operates these firms on their own and they, they're a monopolist. Post office was a monopolist until, until like FedEx and UPS came along the last like 40, 50 years. So the next, next type is control of a key resource. So for, um, for a long time, the aluminum company of America, Alcoa, uh, they either owned or they had long-term contracts for like all of the, the bauxite, which is a mineral that they get aluminum from. So because they had control of the key resource, they basically were a monopoly that no one else could buy, buy bauxite on the market and produce their own aluminum. Um, so this gave them you know, monopoly power and other firms that like, couldn't get in the market because, because these suppliers of bauxite, they had contracts with Alcoa like, not to provide to other firms. Uh, another example that they gave, uh, the, uh, the textbook gave, is the National Football League being a monopoly that it ensures like the, all the best football players in the world are signed to the NFL. This is less the case now. Um, the, with the XFL coming next year, the, um, the Alliance of American Football going on right now. Uh, Johnny Football just signed, so that's really exciting. He's back in the NFL, or back, back in the United States playing football, not in the NFL. So is it a monopoly though, since like, there's like 32 owners? Well, the league itself as an entity would be the monopoly, not the teams within it. Sports are a little bit difficult to, to analyze like that because it's, it's set up differently. But you, the league, of the, like just the NFL, like overarching itself, yeah, gobbles up all the best football. But even in this case, you could argue NFL is still a monopoly because they're getting all the best players. Yeah. And the XFL, the, the AAF, this is like the second rate players that can't get signed. Okay. Maybe T.O. or Chad Johnson come out of retirement, they go to the XFL. The Canadian football league. Yeah, Canadian football league. NFL Europe, when that used to be around. Like. Yeah, so it's debatable whether they have complete control over, over the football athletes as a resource or whether there is actual competition. At one point, Oh, what was the league in the 80s? Was it USFL? They had like Herschel Walker. They had they had a bunch of like the best players. Did you see AFL? Oh, I know you're talking about. I think was that was before that. I think it was the USFL. USFL? Yeah. So they had like Herschel Walker. They had like a bunch of really good players um, that played in that league. They were argued, they were very arguably competitor against the NFL because they were getting the top players. So the NFL did not have control over the, over the best ball players. Back in the 60s, when the AFL was around, they were, they were such a good competitor, they had to merge with the NFL. In that case, the NFL was definitely not a monopolist. So, a question they ask, um, are diamond profits forever? So the most famous um, control of a, of a raw material is the De Beers diamond monopoly. Um, 
in Africa, they had control of like pretty much all the diamonds in the world at one point, and they had it for a long time. Um, they started the whole like buy an engagement ring with a big diamond, and like they started advertising that and like created it out of nothing. Um, and this goes like their their thing goes back to like Cecil Rhodes, like over a hundred years ago. Um, and they could keep the prices high because they had like all the diamonds in the world, like you had to buy from them. But by 2000, there'd been enough competitors, enough new sources of diamonds that De Beers control dropped down to like 40%. So like more than in half of what it used to be. So what they tried to do is, um, is introduce what they called the forever mark. It was like a little brand they put on diamonds to, I don't know, to say it was theirs and it was from a good source or whatever. Um, yeah, as a way to try to retain their monopoly power, that people would still buy from them and different, differentiate them, make it like almost like a different product because it's like I don't know, higher quality or whatever from other diamonds. So the textbook asked if it will work, and I asked, or is it just a blockchain for diamonds? Is it just a, a little fad that no one's going to care about in five years, the forever mark? At this point, I guess only time will tell. Next is um, the third source of monopoly. It's called network effects. Um, so the idea behind it is as more people use a product, the more useful it becomes. And network externalities, definition of that is a characteristic of a product in which its usefulness increases the, with the number of consumers who use it. This makes it difficult for competitors to enter the market because you need a bunch of people to be using it for it to be valuable to people. Um, so imagine like Facebook uh, Facebook, like some people use it because you know everyone else is on it. Um, when Google tried a competitor, Google Plus, you know, back like seven, eight years ago, no one, no one joined it because it was like the same thing, but there were fewer people on it, so there was less of a benefit to join to it, and it was just like a waste of time. Um, another example is auction sites like eBay. A ton of people are on eBay, so why would you go to a different online auction site when you can get more stuff on eBay? Is more valuable because there's more people on there. And then they get social networking sites like Facebook, like the Google Plus example, like that, that was like the same exact thing, so there's no reason for people to jump ship. But I mean, Twitter's come out, and a ton of people use Twitter. Do they buy Twitter? I say, I know they bought Instagram, and they buy Snapchat too. I don't think they also. I thought someone bought Snapchat. Uh, but so, um, MySpace used to be around before Facebook, um, so if you can differentiate yourself enough, you can overcome the network, the network externalities. It doesn't matter as much if you can, you can provide a different benefit or a different sort of thing. Like Instagram, just pictures, Twitter, just like quick words, Facebook has like all the comments and everything. Um, so a number of early adopters can help a firm if they're competing against similar stuff and set off what economists call a virtuous cycle. Where like more people buying it leads to even more people buying it, and success just builds off it. So think of like uh, when Blu-rays first came out, they were competing against what was called HD DVDs. Um, HD DVDs were like super high quality, like super clear, just like Blu-rays, but they used like the red laser and Blu-rays like the blue laser. So there was competition between the two, like, and Blu-rays ended up taking off. More people bought them. Um, once they got enough of a lead, everyone abandoned HD DVDs because they saw, oh, it's just going to go to Blu-ray. We're going to jump on that. So that's how um, network effects can help can help a firm, help uh, like a new product. Uh, another example is Bitcoin versus other cryptocurrencies. Bitcoin was around first. They had like the brand name. People knew about them. Um, so now, even if there's other slightly better cryptocurrencies out there. People are going to buy Bitcoin because they know of it, and there's more people using it. Remember the 3D TVs were supposed to be like the next big thing? Yeah. I was very annoyed that I was going to have to wear 3D glasses every time I watched TV. My cousin bought one of those. Like, he still has it to this day. And like, he, it's just like sick. Do they make any programming for it? I don't think so. I think they like discontinued a lot of the stuff for it. And he said it's like one of the biggest mistakes. <laughs> And that's a great example of network effects. If more people bought it, or more people had those TVs, they'd make programming specifically for it. But since so few people do, like, I don't know, it's, it's a vicious cycle. Few people have it, they're not making anything for it. Few people buy it, it sustains itself. Um, speaking of Bitcoin as an example, I'm just curious, do any of you guys like care about that? 
I know this like so 2017. No, Bitcoin. Oh yeah, he just shit all over Bitcoin. Yeah, so. Anyone in traditional banking though is going to shit on because it's competition. Um, Jamie Dimon did the same thing. He like shit all over, and then like two days later after that giant interview, JP Morgan came out with with their own cryptocurrency. I don't know. I was going to talk about it a little bit in class just because I have a funny story with it. It was such a big news story. Everyone was buying it. That's impressive. One of my friends, like an undergrad, were joking around about it. Like, oh, it first came out well before that. I think it was when it just like passed gold, at like eight hundred dollars for one. We were talking about it. We were thinking about like jumping on it. He actually like started mining it, made a lot of money off it. I did not. I didn't make any money. But I didn't have to suffer from losing like 75% of its value from 2017 till now. Okay, so let's do the final source quick and then get out of here. Final source is a natural monopoly. That occurs when the economies of scale are so large in an industry that one firm can supply the entire market at a lower average cost than two or more firms. So that's also like your, um, your internet provider. If there's two firms in town, they're gonna be competing against each other. It's gonna drive up the cost of, I don't know, just even just laying the wire, going to each house. It's gonna to be too much. These exist when uh, fixed costs are high. So um, again, electricity is the example the textbook gives. You have to do substantial investment in not only creating the power plants, but the transformers, running wires all over the place. Uh, that costs a ton of money to get into. So another firm jumping in there is not gonna do that because they're not gonna make enough money to overcome that. So, so like, like the name says, natural monopoly, it naturally springs up from not being worth it for someone else to jump in. And um, yes, that'll, that'll be it for today. I really don't, wasn't planning on talking about that curve. So, um, so next class, we're going to, um, I'll finish off Monopoly, and then we will um, review for the exam. That will be next Thursday.